Why, hello, lovely humans. Jen Foxbot here. Welcome to another edition of Math Mondays. Da 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 da. Yeah. I feel like I should be doing the wave dance because in today's episode and for the next few episodes, we are going to be diving in to Schrodinger's equation. Yes, it's so cool. It deals with the quantum world of teeny tiny particles and it is really fascinating and also a little bit challenging to solve. This video is going to be a general overview and we're going to talk about what it means, why it's important from a very, very fundamental understanding, AKA if you have no idea what this equation is or how to interpret it, perfect. We will deal with that today. And even if you've taken a little bit of quantum or physics or something like that, I'm hoping that this video will provide you a more solid understanding of the different pieces of the equation. So we're gonna start simple. Humans love to make predictions, right? We like to know, you know, how much money am I gonna have in my bank account? Who am I gonna fall in love with? And how do I impress my friends at a party by throwing a cashew into my friend's mouth every single time? What do I need to do to throw that cashew into my friend's mouth? And so the last situation is actually predictable using physics. We would use Newton's equation, F equals MA, if we wanted to really sit down and figure out how we could turn this funny demonstration into an actual party trick. So what we would do is we would input some information about the cashew and about where I'm throwing it into this equation, and then we could solve for where the cashew is going to land given different starting points. Like if I were to start throwing it here at this angle or down here at this angle, or if I were to just drop it, where would it land? We can use Newton's equation, F equals MA, to solve and very accurately predict where the cashew will end up. And then we could go to a party and show all of our friends and throw the cashew into my friend's mouth every time. And then I'm like, woo, yeah, life a party. I don't know why that's my fun party trick, but so it goes. Um, so what Schrodinger's equation is, is a way of making predictions about teeny, teeny, tiny particles of the quantum world. And those teeny, teeny, tiny particles are what make up all of the atoms in our body and actually everything that we can observe in the universe. And so if we wanna make predictions about these teeny, tiny particles, we have to use Schrodinger's wave equation. Cool, so it's a really, really important equation and why should you care in our big macro world where we are dealing with large objects instead of teeny, teeny, tiny objects? Well, one, because quantum mechanics is super bizarre and strange and awesome. And also because theoretically, Schrodinger's wave equation is more accurate than Newton's equation. And if we understand it, we could theoretically use it to predict the wave function of the universe and have a better understanding of how the universe functions. And there's an interesting philosophical question that comes out of this is, is there free will? I'm getting into the, the questionable territory there, but it is very interesting to discuss how to interpret the results of this. So it is actually really applicable to our everyday lives. Well, maybe not our everyday lives, but to our everyday brains. Okay, so what the heck is this equation telling us? Well, the first piece that I wanna talk about is this symbol here, which is the Greek letter psi, or P-S-I, psi. Oh. Um, and what that is, is this is our wave function. The wave function is an equation that tells us the shape of the probability of the particle. So that's very different than when we are tossing a cashew and figuring out where it lands. Because in that case, the equation is telling us the location of the actual, the actual location of the cashew. In this case, what we are talking about is the location of the, uh, is what we're talking about is the probability of the location of the particle. So this is a probability. As I try and figure out how to spell probability. Okay. So the star of our equation is the wave function, which is the probability of finding the particle at a given, uh, the shape of the probability of finding a given particle at a time. It's actually the psi squared equals the probability. Um, I don't wanna confuse you too much, but the wave function is the shape of the probability. The wave function squared is the actual probability. Um, okay, so, on the left side, we typically can think of this as like the total energy. And then this first term on the right side, we can think of as the kinetic energy of the particle. 
And this last term we can think of as the potential energy. So this letter V actually stands for the potential energy. So these two pieces are a little confusing. I think it is helpful to think about it like the total energy equals the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. But it is also actually really important to understand what these pieces are saying and how they help us to interpret what the heck is going on with this funky wave function and what is going on with this weird particle that is behaving in very bizarre ways. Okay, so let's look at this first term on the left. So this part i h bar, well, i is just the square root of negative one and h bar is just uh, Planck's constant h divided by two pi. So this is a constant term. And the thing that is changing is this partial derivative of the wave function with respect to time. So what this is saying is that um, we need to figure out how our wave function is changing over time. This, right, uh, this term on the right side, negative h bar squared over 2m, where m is the mass of the particle, this piece right here, that is also a constant. And this is what is changing. So this second uh, partial derivative of the wave function deals with how the wave function is changing over space. But it's really more like how the change of the wave function is changing over space. Okay, and you're like, wait, what the heck did you just say? So I'm gonna step into calculus really quick. And if you are very familiar with calculus, you can probably skip this next part. Um, but to better understand both of these pieces, this is gonna be really helpful. Okay, so let's say that we have a parabola. So we're gonna just use generic variables and so that we don't confuse you with the term for space. So T stands for time and X stands for space. Um, and just to note that uh, this would actually be uh, a vector of three dimensions because we live in a three dimensional space with one dimension of time. And, uh, but you can simplify to just talk about one dimension. Uh, so like moving in a straight line makes it way easier to solve this. But anyway, so we don't confuse, I'm gonna call this Z. And so in this case, the equation of a, of a parabola can be represented by a z squared, where a is just some constant that tells us how wide or how narrow our parabola is. And so now I wanna say, okay, well, let's say that I am on a hike and I wanna figure out how much effort I have to expend on my hike. So I decide to figure out how much the slope of my hike is going to be changing over the course of my hike. If I start at, let's say, I'm gonna make up some numbers here, but let's say I start at uh, this negative three, negative three miles, um, and you're like, what is a negative distance? Let's say I have to backtrack or something, I don't know. Um, but for the sake of argument, I start here, which means I, like my little person is like, oh, hey, what's up? I'm gonna go this way, and this represents the distance that I travel. Um, and so I wanna say, okay, well, how hard am I gonna have to work? So let's take the derivative of y with respect to z, oopsies, dy dz equals two a z. And that tells me how hard I'm going to have to work over the course of my hike. Let's plot that so we can better understand it because pictures are super helpful. So this is y prime, which is just dy dz. I wanna be lazy, it's just another way of writing it. y prime equals that, this is z. And what we got is that, oh, don't lose my chalkboard. What we got is that we have a change in our slope or the steepness of our picture, of our parabola, is equal to 2az. And that's just the equation of a line. Whoa! And our slope in that case would be 2a. So how the slope is changing over our hike is equal to 2a. And so what that means is if I start here at negative three, my slope is actually going to be decreasing as I move along the hike. It decreases until I get to this middle point, AKA the bottom of the parabola, and then it starts to increase. And so what this tells me is that because the derivative of y is negative here, our slope is decreasing as I move this way in, uh, in distance. And once I get to here, my slope is gonna be pretty high. So I'm going to decrease until I get to the middle. And the zero basically just means that it's flat. It's not changing. And so I'm like, oh, perfect place to rest. Although I guess if you're just going downhill, it's not too hard. 
especially if you have skis, woo. But then all of a sudden we're like, wait a second, as we keep moving, the steepness is going to increase. Ugh. And so the steepness is not going to be that much if I'm like right here. But by the time I get to the end of my hike or my ski trip or whatever it might be, the steepness of my slope of my hill is going to be pretty dang high and I'm going to be really tired by the time I get up here. And so that is the first derivative. This first derivative tells us how much our uh, picture is changing and what that change looks like. Okay, so that is helpful for this left turn. But then you're like, wait a second, but what the heck is the change of the change? Well, it's a little hard to conceptualize. I think it is helpful to remember that acceleration is the change in speed over time. And I always like to come back to that if I'm like, wait, what? And basically acceleration is just the change in your speed over time. Um, and that is the second derivative of distance. Hopefully that didn't confuse you. Anyway, let's just do this. So d squared y dz squared. So the second derivative of y with respect to z is just going to be equal to 2a, which, hey, look at that. It's a constant. And so if I were to plot y double prime, which is just this, we are going to get a straight line. I hope that I made that straight, where this is z. Um, and then this equals 2a. Look at that. So the change of the change, or alternatively, you could say the change of the steepness is actually constant. And that is fascinating. So this is how we would interpret this piece right here. OK, so I hope that is helpful. Again, really what you can think of if you wanted to zoom back is that you would say this is the total energy equals the kinetic energy of the particle plus the potential energy. To actually solve this, usually what we would do is make some pretty major assumptions, like for example, that uh, the energy of the particle is not changing over time. That allows us to simplify this into a uh, full order derivative equation, where instead of these like squiggly Ds, we have those actual, um, actual Ds. These are the Greek letter D. And so the difference between a partial is that versus this. Um, I'm not going to dive into this too much, but if you have questions about it, uh, partials can often be harder because you're dealing with multiple variables at a time. You just have to do a lot more work, and it's easier to mess up. Um, and full derivatives are easier to find solutions to, especially if you're working by hand. OK, so we would make some assumptions often about time and how the energy is changing over time. Um, and then we can simplify the form of this equation to make it easier to solve for a wave function. OK, and now you're like, what the heck does the wave function actually look like? Excellent question. So really quickly, if we were to say, hey, look at that, our particle exists in a box. Woohoo! And our box has length L, maybe our wave function looks something like that. OK, but then you smart cookies, it remembered. But the, if we want to say anything about the probability, we have to square the wave function. Why, yes, indeed. Thank you for listening. So what that would look like is something like this. And my picture is not going to be perfect. Um, but this is the actual probability of finding the particle between 0 and L. And this is like an example of one dimensional um, wave function. So in this case, um, we would say, oh, hey, look at that. It is most likely that we will find the particle at the, at the middle of the box at L over 2. Not very likely that we'd find the particle. Actually, it probably isn't actually going to be 0. Um, not very likely that we'd find the particle on either sides of the box. And very unlikely that we'd find the particle outside of the box. We also might get a wave function that looks something like this. Whoops, wrong color. Ho oh, ho, here we go. OK. So the wave function can often take on many forms. So if we got something that looked like that, we'd be like, wait, what? Don't worry, we square it. And we're going to get something like this. So in this case, it's actually more likely, most likely, that we would find the particle at either one of these points. This would be um, L over 4, 3L over 4. Not very likely we'd find the particle in the middle of the box, which is kind of odd, but that's the shape of the wave function. That's what this is telling us. And still, very unlikely that we'd find the particle outside of the box, which is what we would expect. 
Although I will say that because of the pro probability, the probability that we'd find it outside the box might not be zero. Very bizarre. Okay, so that's what the uh, wave function would look like. In the next video, we are going to dive into statistics and probability because at the heart of it, the Schrodinger wave equation is really about, well, probability, because we're dealing with a wave function that is the shape of the probability of the particle and is not the actual particle itself. So we have to be very comfortable with probability and the base of probability is statistics. Woohoo! So that's our next video. Uh, but please let me know if you have any questions about what we covered, and eventually we will actually get to solving, well, simplified forms of the Schrodinger wave equation. So let me know if there are particular forms that you would want me to dive into. We'll probably do the time-independent version, which is a lot easier. Cool. All right. So thank you very much for watching. And if you like these videos, please support me on Patreon so that I can keep making them and I can keep doing more and better videos. Yay! All right, we'll see you next time. Thanks very much. Bye!